Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from Hawaii News Online and Etobo News in Honolulu. And with me is Dr. Peter Talo. Uh, he's in College Station, Texas. And we're going to give you a summary of today's uh, news headlines. And <clears throat> I have some interesting Even updates for you. Point. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Hi, and Peter. I How's uh, it's, it's actually very nice and sunny here in Hawaii today after we had a few days of rain. Yes. And uh, so the pictures you, see, you saw running yesterday on e News about the catastrophic floods, um, they seem to be far away today. Yes, it's, it's kind of like here when we had the terrible uh, snowstorm, which by the way, they're going to have a, a major snowstorm in Denver. It's supposed to be the biggest snowstorm since 1913. And they're expecting 35 or 40 inches of snow going to stop all the plane traffic at the Denver airport. But wow. um, here in uh, College Station, we're very happy. Today is supposedly the first day that we have a good chance to hit 80 degrees. And um, in my feeling of alliance with the people of Hawaii, I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt because I know how much you guys suffered yesterday from the floods. So I wanted you to see that I care. And so I'm wearing my Aloha shirt. So Aloha from the great state of Texas. Uh, to the people of Hawaii. So lots, but beside the weather, which is always an issue, um, lots is going on. Of course, lots of it is kind of the gossip world of uh, the royals and their little gossip thing and stuff going on on the border and stuff going on with um, uh, the governor of New York. But in the tourism world, we have other really major events. I know you were telling me about a new air um, route that's being started between Hawaii and Orlando. If I'm yeah, and you can, if you stay tuned, you will see this. Uh, we, we're starting a nonstop service on Hawaiian Airlines between Honolulu and Orlando, Florida. And the East Coast, even in best times, was never a major top market for the U.S. Yes, we do have two nonstops to New York, one on Hawaiian and one on United. And we have another Hawaiian Airlines nonstop to Boston. But adding Orlando is... Um, quite brave, I would say, and we're going to find out more after meeting the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines and the governor. <laughs> this will be part of this broadcast. Yeah. So you can hear how this is coming uh, coming together. You think the reason uh, for that is they want to be more involved with Disney World, or do they want to skip the California West Coast? In other words, and, and um, it's a long flight from Honolulu to Orlando. It's not going to be a comfortable flight with a mask on. But uh, of course, Florida is open. Florida was the first state to be really open. And um, the economy in Florida is booming. Uh, I wonder if um, you know the Hawaiians are going to Florida maybe to get away from masks? Well, I don't think we're, we're too much about um, Hawaiians going someplace. I think it's the other way around. Well, Hawaii is looking for tourists. And, and I think this may be an opportunity they haven't thought about. Kind of remote, maybe both both way travel is fine. People love Disney World, of course, and Disneyland, and uh, there could be a maybe it's also an attempt to get traffic away from Caribbean destinations. Hawaii is now competing; our tourism numbers are way down, and everyone is competing uh, very hard. So this could be another reason, um, and hopefully we find out more today. Well, Hawaii has some advantages over the Caribbean. It's clearly um, English speaking. And for Americans, we don't need a passport to go to Hawaii, which um, means that you don't have some of the problems of international travel. Um, of course, the Caribbean is closer to the big population centers on the East Coast. But um, the other thing is that California, which is doing so poorly, and um, I don't think this, um, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Disneyland is still closed or semi-closed. And so Orlando is really, the other side of the Disney World, Disneyland uh, uh, spectrum, we might say. And of course, there's huge numbers, not only Disney World in Orlando, but lots of other theme parks. I mean, Orlando is theme park city. So um, may, I'm wondering if they're hoping to bring people in from Asia, in other words, stop in Hawaii and then from Hawaii go on to uh, Orlando. I don't know. I'm just trying to think that through. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Of course, right now at this moment, there are no flights to Asia from here. It's still COVID times with some very rare exceptions. And I'm not even aware of these exceptions are still operating. Uh, but in the future, this could be an interesting thought to combine Hawaii with a vacation 
in the theme parks in Florida. So uh, interesting idea. Yeah, I'm wondering also one of the things we're starting to see different places open up around the world. I, I know that uh, Greece is kind of reopening. Now, I don't know if they're just taking a stab in the dark, or I do know there's a deal between Israel and Greece. Uh, Israel is working hard at, um, at vaccinating many of the people in Greece. Uh, Israel has a surplus now of a vaccine. And um, I'm wondering if the Greeks are hoping that vaccinations will allow them to open or they're just taking a stab in the dark and making believe that Corona went away. I, I well, don't I, I don't really think that it has a lot to do with Israel, what's happening in Greece. Greece as an yeah. EU member is mostly trying to get traffic yeah. within other EU countries. And EU well, countries but the, are, a lot of the EU members are disgusted with the EU and they're leaving. Uh, they're not leaving physically, but we know that Denmark and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and um, uh, who else? Uh, one other country, it, it is, escapes me for the moment, but um, they're all uh, uh, kind of really angry at the poor level that the EU has dealt with uh, the coronavirus. And um, many of the European countries are really suffering. They're not doing well. And so they're looking for another alternatives. No, no, we're talking about really inter-European travel. Inter-European yes, travel really has never stopped for the most part, but there are now new uh, regulations. And what is, what's happening in Greece that the Minister of Tourism two days ago announced, or yesterday, no, two days ago, announced that Greece will let anyone in who is vaccinated yeah. um, and uh, also uh, who can show a test. At the same time, the infection numbers within Greece are going, are, up. Are going up. So it's, an, it's a very strange way of thinking. Now, this was applauded by the World Travel and Tourism Council. Uh, they made a statement yesterday saying that they applaud the actions by Greece for open borders, and they feel this is the right step forward uh, to open in what they call in a safe way. I know we as the World Tourism Network kind of countered that yes, it's a great idea to open borders and find a safe path, like in this case, uh, to require vaccine and tests and so forth. But on the other hand, you have to be cautious and keep the situation within these, these countries also in mind, because it's not only an issue for Greece, it's also an issue for other countries, for visitors that go there on a vacation and come back home and import mm -hmm. Uh, this virus back into right. their own community. So it's kind of an interesting, um, there are a few countries, I think Iceland's one and Belize is another, that do allow people, um, basically there are open borders now. Um, Austria was the other country I couldn't think of in Europe that's really annoyed with the EU. Um, on the other hand, some of the countries that have really done good jobs of vaccination, like Israel, don't allow foreigners in. So Israel is almost beyond uh, COVID, but you can't get into Israel with a foreign passport yet. You, you, so it's kind of a different, uh, the Greeks, on the other hand, have COVID going up, but they're letting open borders. So um, some countries, I think Iceland is one, uh, Belize, now Greece. Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon, which way things will go. Um, and how this will react with, and there could be some political consequences within the EU. So that's- Yeah, it is, but it's, not, it's really, this, this particular move, Peter, is for within EU travel. So it really yeah, has very, very little to do with any other country. But if we talk it from a, a world perspective, yes, you're absolutely right. And besides Israel, also the Seychelles as a very small country. And many of the small countries that are able to control their borders in a better way than a larger country, um, have done so. The Seychelles is opening up to anyone with vaccine. But would this mean at the end there are really different opinions that we're going to have two parts, uh, two type of societies, those that are vaccinated and those that are not vaccinated? I think that's actually happening. Yes, I think that's, that is, um, th there is a real um, sense of when you get vaccinated, you have moved to a different category of human being. And um, I know that when I got my vaccination cards and finished, I um, went and had them laminated. And I said to the lady, I feel like I want a jackpot. And she said, yes, everyone who comes in says the same thing. In other words, you feel like you've moved from one class of person to another class yes. and it's a liberation card. Um, so, I, you know, it's hard to tell um, how this world is gonna work itself out. Um, 
I'm, I'm afraid it's not going to be as quickly as I think people would like. On the other hand, there's tremendous amount of COVID, um, uh, of people being tired of COVID, of COVID fatigue, and there's the economic consequences. And of course, lots of people with small businesses or whatever, they're really suffering. So they're not suffering from COVID, but they're suffering from will they exist or will they go will they go under? Um, and we see that I, we talked about it last time about Brazil. The situation, by the way, in Brazil is getting worse. It's, it's now over 2 million people a day and the hospital system is now on the verge of collapse. And so, but each country has its own particular problems. We talked about Brazil. How do you keep social distancing in a place where you have large uh, slums, uh, favelas? And, and those are almost impossible to keep a difference. Yeah, and you can you can see every place in the world has different opportunities, different situations, and one isn't uh, the same as others. Even if you look at, at a large country like ours, uh, you have very different situations. I mean, I would probably feel 100% safe to go hiking in, in the Arch Arch National Park in Utah or someplace in Montana. Uh, I don't think you have to worry too much about COVID. Uh, but no. if you if you go through Manhattan in New York, it becomes a different story. Of so course, if you have a lot of people in Manhattan. You right. have a lot of people yeah. in, <laughs> <laughs> in a national park in in Montana. You can be like you know I I I don't disagree that you should use a mask. But when I go walking at six in the morning, I don't wear a mask. I'm the only person on the street, and I right. don't think I'll give the trees COVID. Um, so, but if I go into a supermarket tomorrow morning. I will wear a mask. So I think there's, we're going to have to put a little bit of common sense into this. And I don't know if the public has that much common sense. Hopefully they do. And it's, in travel though, the big fear that I have is the issue of terminals and getting airline, uh, air, airport terminals are probably the most dangerous place going. Yeah, of course, because you have people coming in from all sides of, um, the world and uh, coming together. And I'll see this, uh, you, you'll probably see me later on on this news broadcast because we're going to combine it, uh, going to the airport in Honolulu and uh, expecting the departure. So I really need Hawaiian you, uh, are you gonna, hopefully you're going to social distance and wear a mask. I wear my uh, N95 mask and I swear I still cannot understand for the world of it why the CDC is not recommending N95 for anyone. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's a completely misleading of the American people. It's criminal. And um, a CDC should not get away with this in, in not telling the truth uh, to, to, uh, to everyone. I understand well, it's a different story if there are not enough masks. But then you say this, you say there are not enough for everyone. So this is the best, second best alternative, but saying you don't need this mask because it's not going to do anything for you is simply wrong. And we all, everyone, who, yeah. you know. Well, people are going to have to make compromises and um, come up with what they can. Certainly a poor family is going to have trouble buying, you know, five masks for everybody and then changing all the time. I would say at this point, I really, the important thing is that people do wear a mask when they're in public. That's already 40% is better than zero. So it doesn't mean that now the real issue is why are they so expensive? Why don't why aren't they given out for free? Yeah, and, that, and in many, many countries where you have a public health care system or you have an insurance system, like in Europe, it's not a public health care system except in the UK, uh, where, but where the insurance are mandated in prevention and not just in treatment. Yes. Um, then um, this becomes also an advantage of being in such a system and not to go into the healthcare system here, but we're, I think we're focusing way too much on treating people that are sick, what is cheaper because they're only gonna be a small percentage instead of getting a large percentage of people prepared for any illness, whether it's COVID and yeah. any type of tests. I actually think it's cheaper to do preventative medicine because you right. don't lose people from going to work. You don't, um, you don't have to have as much invested in all the types of hospitals, but that's another story for another day. Um, I think right now the real issue is the world needs to be thinking through how to open up. We need to be getting vaccines to as many people as possible around the world. 
And we need to be thinking of what will be the next stage of tourism. Hopefully in 2021, we can say that the COVID era has come to an end and we can by 2022 be really open to a world where the world we used to know and back to a world of where people traveling and getting to know each other and business going back, those will be major, major successes if we can do it. Yes, absolutely. And, and let's, let's hope for this. All right. Uh, we're so all going from, <laughs> from month to month right now. We don't know what the next month will yes. do, but yeah. let's see where it progresses. Well, go represent us at the airport in Hawaii and try not to get sick and wear your Aloha shirt like me and know that uh, while I will not be in Hawaii, I'll be in College Station, Texas, I'll be with you all in spirit. All right, Peter. Okay, bye you bye. take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. at this time uh, to share a few thoughts with you. My pleasure to introduce our President and CEO of Hawaiian Airlines, Mr. Peter Ingram. Mahalo Debbie, aloha everyone. Uh, on, on behalf of all of us at Hawaiian Airlines, uh, it is uh, really special for me to welcome you all here to join us as we celebrate our inaugural flight to Orlando, Florida. This, uh, this new service uh, really marks a, a significant time for our airline and, and I've noticed you know, throughout the past week all of the talk in the media has, uh, much of the talk in the media has been about the, the news of the anniversary of the declaration of a pandemic and so many of the challenges that we have faced in the past year. It's really uplifting for me personally, uh, and I'm sure for our airport team and the crew operating the flight today, to not only be able to be starting to restore service, but to welcome uh, guests like you today to a new non-stop market from Honolulu Airport to Orlando, Florida. We are, we are grateful um, to um, the state of Hawaii, all the partners we work with, and the people of Hawaii for everything they have done uh, to maintain Hawaii as a safe destination, which is critical to allow us to rebuild the tourism industry. Uh, and we're excited to embark on this new chapter uh, flying service to the Sunshine State uh, from the Aloha State, uh, which will be the first ever scheduled flight from uh, Hawaii to Florida. Um, Orlando is a city we've uh, we've had our eyes on for uh, for quite a while. Um, we're pleased to. Um, not only be welcoming visitors from, uh, from another destination on the eastern U.S., but also to offer a new place for our Kamaaina travelers, because we know this is a very popular place for visitation as well, and, and our Hawaii people like to travel, and I know that that includes so many of you today who are excited to get a non-stop flight to Orlando. Uh, this is our third destination now in the eastern U.S., uh, following additions in recent years of Boston and New York and the first city in the Southeast uh, US to join our network. And over the next few weeks, we've got some other additions coming, including new service to Ontario, California, and Austin, Texas coming next month. Uh, as we prepare to board today's flight, I want to recognize and thank our, our airport team, uh, our folks working on the ground, the in-flight crew, and the pilots who are gonna operate today's flight. 
who have worked tirelessly to welcome you all and uh, welcome you today safely. Uh, and finally, I'd like to, uh, to thank Governor Ige for joining us today to mark this special occasion and uh, welcome him to say a few words. Uh, mahalo to all of you for making this new group possible and have a safe and enjoyable time when you're in Orlando. Aloha. 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 Uh, thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction and the opportunity to speak to all of you as we welcome the first ever nonstop flight from Hawaii to Florida. Um, flight 86 represents not only the entry of a Hawaii carrier into the second largest U.S. market, it re represents increased opportunities for our residents like all of you to travel and experience the popular Orlando attractions and the national sport sporting competitions for Kamainas. While we are celebrating this bold move by one of our premier local businesses, I must also address the pandemic and air travel. We will continue to be vigilant in our safe travels program and Hawaiian Airlines continues to be a vital trusted partner with the state of Hawaii to ensure safe air travel for all. We continually assess our travel policies to keep communities safe as we work on economic recovery. Hawaiian's nonstop service between Honolulu and Orlando will provide geographic diversification and growth in passenger opportunities. This will be a big step in increasing revenues for the state and getting our community members back to work. Hawaii continues to have the lowest rate of COVID infections and the lowest death rate in the country. And we are all getting better at knowing what actions we need to take to keep our community safe. Wear, wear our masks, wash our hands, and maintain our distance. I'm thankful for all of the residents here who will be on this uh, inaugural flight to Orlando. I want to thank you for making the sacrifices to continue to keep Hawaii safe uh, and really appreciate all of you. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank Hawaiian Airlines for taking this bold step in expanding service so that our Kamaina have the opportunity to safely travel around the United States. COVID has changed Hawaii, but I embrace this move by Hawaiian Airlines to safely grow the visitor industry and to help those in our community that are struggling. We need to get people back to work. We want our travelers to be responsible and wear their masks. We want our friends and family to be able to safely gather and travel. Mahalo again to Peter and the entire Hawaiian Airlines Ohana for bringing this exciting new air travel choice uh, to our residents and visitors alike. May all your roads grow and be successful. Thank you. Mahalo, Governor and Peter, for those uh, fine remarks to put us in this place of gratitude and appreciation. Um, and as the governor mentioned, to be safe. So while we start preparing to board, be mindful of your distance, be mindful of each other, and to, you know, take care, and again, be aware of your surroundings. One of the traditions, besides hula and music, when we send off a new aircraft or a new flight, is to do a blessing. It too is a tradition at Hawaiian Airlines, and it gives me great privilege to introduce one of our, our own Hawaiian Airlines employees who has um, gone to the, the ranks of retirement and is now off on a new tangent and a new path. He will be conducting our blessing today, Keone Martin. Oh, ka uno ia e ano inei e 
ali anay ko iyo kay kimay ahi kimay no oy ahi kipuno me ke aloha aloha e And keep on aloha kako, aloha. aloha. I'd like to say that e hui pu ana kako i ke ia la no ka ho'opo mai kai. No, ke ia kaulana la. We are here today for the blessing, of course, of joining two cities, connecting them with aloha and ho'okipa. And as is custom with Hawaiian Airlines, the music and the gathering. We of course use the elements known to our islands. As you see the Maile Le over there, the Maile is the connection between the heavens and earth. We also use the Hawaiian salt, the Pa'akai. And the Pa'akai is of course used to preserve all the energy and to preserve all the goodness. And also, we use the water, the water to purify. And we, of course, all together, we want to make sure that there is purification and multitudes of blessings for this route so that Hawaii, Hawaiian Airlines together can be Ho'ovai Vai. Yeah? Can you say Ho'ovai Vai? That means prosperous, right? We have to Ho'omua move forward already. And you know, as Mr. Ingram had mentioned earlier, you know, the reason why we use the Miley is because it takes many people, many hands to put together this beautiful day. And he has acknowledged the many hands from the executive level to airport operations and the crew that make it possible for today. But of course, I think I join a lot of people in saying, mahalo to you, Peter, and to our governor, you know, to helping us move forward and to bring back such a joyous occasion. So I want to ask you folks to come follow me to the Miley and we're going to make the blessing. Kia akua manawa, kia akua aloha, e hoopo bai kai ana, ke ia le Miley, do ka vehe ana, do ke ia, Ala hele ho ma ke ia kula na kohale o Honolulu. Ai vehe ana vehe ana ke ala hele ho. Mahalo mahalo. Belina mai kapo. Thank you. Mahalo again for joining us today on this very exciting day of our inaugural flight to Orlando from Honolulu. Uh, we will leave you in the care of the grace and the hospitality of both our guest services that will be starting boarding soon, as well as our flight crews that will be taking care of you on your flight. Keep our guests and keep our crew members safe and healthy in their journeys. Could you address the fact that um, Beat for U.S. Airlines, and with that, we are now at a point where we can confirm uh, that we will not be furloughing any employees any earlier than September. And our hope is that this is going to give us time to uh, to grow and continue to rebuild as we see visitors uh, beginning to come more to Hawaii, and, and we will be able to to move beyond furloughs uh, indefinitely and and really start a new era of growth for Hawaiian Airlines. And um, tell us a little bit about how important the significance is of adding a flight to Florida and to the Southeast expanding that Eastern network. Um, one of the things that, that we're aware of is that the uh, the depth of some of our traditional markets isn't going to come back to 100% fully. So this gives us an opportunity to broaden our network and reach out to new visitors. Orlando in particular is exciting because um, we have demand not only from 
the Orlando area and the Tampa area, but also from people here in Hawaii who enjoy traveling to Orlando for all the visitor attractions that it has to offer. But Orlando is not an airline hub like Atlanta or Chicago or anything like that. It is, it is, so you expect the traffic to specifically come between Orlando and Honolulu? Or are you also competing or getting people to travel to Hawaii instead of the Caribbean or Bahamas? What's right at the door? We expect most of the traffic to originate either in Central Florida or in Hawaii. Without, with, There will be some connections, but it'll be limited. But I mean, your target in Florida, in Central Florida, is, um, is the idea also to get people from Florida to think about Hawaii over thinking about going to Jamaica or to some other to a Caribbean destination? I, I think for us it's more of a compliment. If you, the part of the reason we were attracted to Orlando is that there already is a lot of demand that comes on connecting services today. Typically, when you add an on-stop service, we um, we not only get that, some of that demand, but we also stimulate new demand because it is more convenient for people to travel non-stop. So we think that's where most of the traffic will come from. From the revenue point, flights to Orlando between Honolulu and Orlando has been quite cheap compared to flights Honolulu to Washington, for example, or even New York. Um, and uh, I mean, I've seen it myself. You can buy a ticket. Yeah on United via Washington or Newark to Orlando for a lot less money than just going to Orlando. Um, is this a risk you're taking with the low fares in place or will this change after or has it changed? I, I think we're going to have very competitive service and we will uh, we will price according to uh, the market and we believe we're offering people new travel options and we'll be able to price competitively as we have when we've added service to places like Boston and New York. So most of our travelers, given the nature of our network, are leisure travelers and the vast majority of it is independent. I think it's going to take a while before we get um, business travel back, which isn't significant for Hawaii, but there is some when you think of conventions and group travel, I think it's going to be a while before that traffic comes back. But there's a lot of pent up demand from people who uh, want to travel for leisure and are looking to get away. Uh, they've been cooped up in their homes uh, for a long time in the past year and people are really looking for places where they can go, especially go safely. And, and we offer um, the fact that we've been very successful here in Hawaii of controlling the virus and I think that's going to appeal to a lot of people when they are thinking about where they want to go. And to maintain successful with the virus, from California there are approved vaccination, or not vaccination, test facilities uh, where people need to go and get a test before they come to Hawaii. Now there are rapid tests. I know your own airline is providing this at some airlines. How, will, how would this be handled in Florida? Uh, the same rules apply for the, the Florida flights as do all our flights. That, that To avoid quarantine, you need to have a PCR test within 72 hours. And, and we will work as we have in other locations to make sure that there are testing options available people, so people can get those tests before they travel. What about what some airlines specifically in the uh, Middle East, uh, I'm talking about specifically Qatar, Etihad and Emirates are doing, requiring a, a rapid test. And I heard Lufthansa is going to be along this line now. Um, right before they board a flight, I mean, you get results pretty much instantly as a second assurance. Is this going to be a plan altogether for your airline? So we, we think that the safe travels protocols have been very, very successful. Uh, we really, uh, even as we've seen an increase in visitors since September 15th, we haven't seen a uh, significant spike in cases and certainly not a spike in travel related cases. So we think the 72 hour test plan is working and it has proven to work and, and um, we're, we're going to reinforce that protocol and make sure our travelers know about that before they get on our flights. But you don't, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, there's just talk about uh, vaccination passports now and there, there has been some talk in the media about potentially either having a vaccination passport or using some of the travel restrictions that are for any passengers. How important do you think it is that we um, move forward in this endeavor? Say the last part again. The vaccination passports as yeah. well as we see restrictions for vaccinated passengers. Yeah. How important do you think it would be to the flight? So I, 
I, I think, you know, we're not the policy makers. I think there's been a lot of discussion about whether proof of vaccination, completing the vaccination protocol should exempt people from testing. Right now, that's not the rule for Hawaii. Right now, that's not the, um, the guidance that the CDC has laid out more generally. Uh, but I think when the CDC laid it out their initial guidance for people who were vaccinated the other day, they said they're going to continue to evolve and expand that guidance and they'll be guided by science and data. And we welcome that. And I, I think, um, you, you know, as people understand how travel is safe, and particularly air travel with all the protocols that we've put in place, and we learn more about how people with vaccines are, are um, their susceptibility to carrying the virus, I, I think it would be a great alternative for people to be able to use that as a, uh, an alternative to getting a test. But I leave that to the policy makers to decide how that, how and when that's ultimately implemented. Sorry, Sorry quick picture with the pilots. Yeah. We'll come back. <laughs>
the, the vast majority of the vaccine that's available. The last stats I had on it was that 75% of the vaccine available is um, already cornered by 10% of the world's largest countries. Where that leaves small countries such as ours, and particularly those that are highly tourism dependent, like the Caribbean and the Philippines and the Maldives and so on, is in a state where we are going to be left behind. So if the politics of vaccine is to be played out, then the smaller countries are going to be left behind and that will cause a, quite a bit of disruptiveness, not just within our own space, but in the global community. Yeah, My take on the matter therefore is perhaps testing should continue and negative test requirement for, 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 for entry into countries could be a way forward. <coughs> a vaccine will definitely be part of the mix, but I cannot see it as being the reason or the reason that for travel in the short term. <clears throat> but you're in a difficult place here, aren't you? Because on the one hand, you, your, your own people, your citizens, you don't want a, a vaccine requirement, a, a vaccination passport requirement, because you want them to be vaccinated as well, and you don't want the economy to suffer. But your main tourism comes from those countries that are highly vaccinated, and those countries may... Uh, the people in those countries may demand that they only go to places that require other tourists to be vaccinated. So you're caught in the middle. Yes, indeed, you're quite right. And that's uh, part of the concern and uh, 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 diplomacy has to be engaged here, Richard, uh, where we have to look at how um, do we um, have a balance. And that, that discussion will have to take place at, at, at many levels, including um, the tourism authorities, the UNWTO, WTTC, and other um, mega entities that help to manage um, the industry globally. I think also that local diplomatic arrangements will have to be engaged in that regard, because you're right. The larger countries that are highly vaccinated will require, and indeed I fear that a tearing system might even ensue where they begin to categorize countries in relation to the level of vaccination that they have achieved. And that would be, I think, devastating for us, particularly those who continue to suffer. I make the point very quickly for you that of the 100 countries so far, according to Bloomberg, that has had any level of vaccination, most of the third world is out of it. There are 130 other countries in the world who have not had a single dose of vaccine or indeed a full program planned as to when their vaccination will begin. So immediately we see how the anomalies are going to play out and the difficulties that will ensue in terms of um, global politics in this regard. We've got the this new, the Global Travel and Tourism Resilience Council, which is creating and curating various sessions and events, including this one, to, to, to pull together the issues that we're learning around crises. How, how can this council, looking at, I mean, it's, it's eminent members, self-included, this is a major crisis, but I assume that the Resilience Council is going to be there for other crises as things move forward. Well, the Resilience Council, of which, you know, I'm co-chair with um, Dr. Talib Refai, along with the Global Resilience and Crisis Management Center are two of the key, I think, institutions that are at the forefront of looking at how to drive equity and fairness within the, the industry overall. But the more important role with them, Richard, is how to help countries to build capacity to withstand uh, uh, disruptions such as pandemics, uh, to manage it, to recover, and to thrive afterwards. And I think that the role is going to be heightened during this period, especially in getting the, the right. small and less resourced countries to develop the capacity to understand what is required of them and how they should act. But I think finally they have to create a stronger voice and they will have to collaborate with a number of other global network to ensure a better understanding of what is required of everybody, but more so, to develop within them the capacity to act and the will to act, because that is going to drive the necessary um, action that will enable resources to be had.
So, so Minister, I want to finish talking about your own country again, Jamaica, and, and you know, the, com the tourism companies, the travel companies, the hotels, the airlines, they're suffering. So they only have limited capacity for investment and to pick up the slack of jobs, furloughs and things like that. The, Jamaica clearly still needs to put forward a first class tourism product, and that is going to require government to borrow, to, to take on debt, to, to, to go to the international lending organizations, because if you don't, along with other Caribbean countries, you'll be left behind. You're in a very tricky position. Indeed, I tell you, uh, we've been grappling with that. Well, fortunately for Jamaica, um, if this pandemic continues much further than now, we could be in a difficulty. But for the moment, Jamaica is faring reasonably well because we've managed our economy fairly well and we've had reserves that we are able to draw on now. And we were able to create um, stimulus packages that have enabled the industry to sort of hang on, if you will. But you're right. Um, we would very well have to go to multilateral sources for, for support. Um, but the good news, if there's uh, any that we could draw on, is that Jamaica continues to have very favorable uh, investment responses. Only last week, I, I had, had to uh, meet with a large group out of um, Europe looking at uh, new properties here in Jamaica. The investors who are building new rooms are still uh, on track to build. And, um, and those who are expanding are also still expanding. So, so far for us, we haven't lost the appetite for investment, but I can't say that to be the same for all of the Caribbean areas. So you're absolutely right. The Caribbean uh, leaders will have to go to uh, dig deep and if they, um, find multilateral partners and to create also very favorable climate for investment which will result uh, perhaps in a number of concessionary arrangements that would uh, put back their own uh, revenue development and programs, but will create jobs and that will be good for the future development of the region. Minister, you have Jamaica Cares, which is a sort of a suite of policies designed, designed for what? Well, designed to create confidence in the destination uh, by looking at the new traveler, the generation COVID, as we call them, Gen C, uh, which really is a collapsing of all the demographics that we have known, you know, the millennials, the baby boomers, etc., uh, coming together to create one new demographic that is going to be driven by health security arrangements, by uh, safety and, and at seamlessness, and, um, and also a level of technological support to enable touchless arrangements um, as you manage the, the COVID um, pandemic. And so Jamaica has developed this suite of, of, of policies and, um, and strategies to ensure that the visitors who come to Jamaica are safe, secure, and as protected as is possible from any vaccine, I'm sorry, from any um, uh, spread of, um, of, of the disease. Uh, the enablement that this will provide goes beyond the the cost of, of, of putting this package together because it gives a feeling and, and a sense of satisfaction and comfort that when you come to Jamaica, anything happens to you, you'll be covered. And so there's an insurance component to it, which enables for uh, testing if necessary. And if you're positive, um, hospitalization, if you um, are uh, asymptomatic, you can be isolated if you wish, but you'll be enjoying all the wonderful assets that are still available to us through what we have called the elegant, uh, resilient corridor, which is our bubble to ensure that you are removed from the rest of the um, infection possibilities in the wider so, community. So, so the, 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 the plan is basically to say to people, if you've got it, the, we'll, you know, you, you'll, you'll be treated. Uh, I mean, the idea is what? To create a, a sense of security? Yes, beyond security too, but also to create a cost-effective way of ensuring that um, you enjoy your vacation and the event that anything happens to you, you're secure and you don't have to find additional resources 
to cover your costs. And I think that that is a very, very powerful message um, and statement that we could make to enable a visitor to know that you are in a pandemic, problems may happen. And if it happens, you would not have to have any additional expenditure to get treatment to be dealt with, but also you can be repatriated to your country within that same cost arrangement. Minister, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Next time we speak, God willing, we will be in your beautiful country, looking at the wonderful beaches, enjoying the gentle warm breeze and socially distance having a drink. I look yes. forward to that, Minister. Me too, and I look forward to having you sooner than later. So we continue to manage this uh, pandemic and do what is necessary to um, beat it off and say goodbye pandemic. Let's go back to normalcy. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Beaches is all about families, and keeping your family safe is our number one priority. That's why we created our Platinum Protocol of Cleanliness, setting a new standard of excellence in health and safety protocols to give you a worry-free destination wedding of a lifetime. Beaches was built on connection. Connecting with family and friends, celebrating old times, and creating new beginnings. And we know the love you have for your family and having them there for the most special time of your life is what's most important. At Beaches, you can still have that happily ever after with a fully customized destination wedding surrounded by the people who mean the most to you. You can feel safe saying, I do, in a lush tropical garden. Or walking down a white sand aisle with a calm blue sea as your backdrop. Our wedding venues are found in wide open spaces, nature made for celebrating your love. And while we've always led the industry in health and safety protocols, our resorts are even safer now than ever, giving you a wedding free of worries surrounded by love. That's why we've reduced the capacity of our venues and put more physical distance between guests Instead of tables for eight at your reception, we'll seat only six guests per table. We've eliminated buffets and specialty food stations, so all food will be plated and served by Beach's staff wearing masks. We're even offering live stream service of your wedding ceremony, so your friends and family who can't travel right now can still share in your special day. Once the vows have been exchanged, the honeymoon of a lifetime begins. And we're taking every measure necessary to ensure your health and safety during your stay at Beaches. As part of the Sandals Resorts family, we've followed in their footsteps in setting a new standard of excellence with our Platinum Protocol of Cleanliness. Together with the extensive research from local ministries and health officials, the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, Beaches has instituted advanced hygiene practices across 18 key touch points. A triple check system that includes inspecting, cleaning, and sanitizing hard surfaces and common areas every 20 minutes. Adding auto dispensing hand sanitizing stations throughout the resort. To ensure the utmost safety, Beaches will be using hospital grade disinfectants, electrostatic sprayers for advanced cleaning, UV lighting equipment to inspect cleanliness, and air duct sanitization for each room before every guest's arrival. We've gone so far as to steam clean and sanitize carpeting and flooring prior to arrivals and placing personal hand sanitizers in every guest room. For added safety, all staff members are required to wear protective face gear at all times. And from now on, guests can check in online at home so they can bypass the front desk and go directly to their rooms. Stricter physical distancing protocols have also been put in place in every part of the resort. 
Chlorine and pH levels at all our pools and water parks are monitored every two hours. And we've taken added measures to protect the health and safety of your family. Our kids' camps facilities are sanitized before and after each use. And all of our professional nannies carry pocket-sized bottles of hand sanitizer. Our tween and teen hangouts, including the Xbox Play Lounge and Trench Town, are sanitized before and after each use with hospital-grade disinfectants. In addition, all our spa facilities and sports equipment will be sanitized before and after use to protect the health and safety of our guests and their families. Both Sandals and Beaches are committed to providing strict compliance and implementation of these safety protocols, so much so that we've created a dedicated quality inspection team at each resort to make sure all safety measures are adhered to. We can't wait to help you make your dreams come true with a destination wedding at Beaches. And while you're focused on your new life together, surrounded by those you love the most, we'll take care of everything else.